When we're talking about hydrogeology, one of the most important things to understand is where water is and where it goes. And this is really basic. You know, most of us learned this in, in elementary school. I think third grade, I want to say, is when we covered the water cycle. But it does keep on coming up again and again. So it's worth reviewing, right? The basic water cycle when we're talking about is the cycle that water goes through uh, as it transfers between different states. So the most basic form of water that we think of is liquid, right? So we start off with liquid water in some lake, river, reservoir, take your pick. And then what we usually start with is we say liquid water on earth, liquid water on earth. And what can happen to that? In some state, it will get evaporated, right? And of course, that's when energy from the sun in the form of radiation heats it up past its boiling point and it evaporates. It becomes a gas. So this is evaporation. We'll say evap evaporation, right? And then it goes up into the atmosphere. It is a gas in the atmosphere. And of course, then we know what happens to it is it condenses, cond for short, condensation, and it becomes a liquid in the atmosphere, which is clouds. Uh, you'll see those, of course, if you fly up in an airplane, you can see them from the ground, look up, you know, all the different cloud types. What uh, looks like there's some good cumulus clouds in the sky right now. So we get liquids in the atmosphere. And then, of course, once they get heavy enough and once enough water accumulates, once the vapor pressure is increased by the, uh, the presence of water, what we get is precipitation, right? And that's, of course, physical liquid water or solid water in the form of snow. Uh, falling back to the earth. And there might be some middleman in between here with water doesn't immediately go back to a river or a lake, right? It might collect in some surface, uh, it might seep into the ground. So this is where we have things like uh, another process. So we'll call this intermediate. Uh, before it returns to a main uh, body of water, what we might have is some intermediate state in the ground on a surface and then through processes such like such as runoff uh, infiltration groundwater infiltration and then moving uh, through the ground it will eventually return to some body of water so that's the basic water cycle okay nothing nothing mind-blowing there an important thing to understand with these water cycle processes though is that all of them are transfers of water water mass in and out of systems so of course in earth sciences systems broadly refers to any piece of the universe, any subset of the universe that we can define with clear boundaries, right? So the earth would be a classic example, a little earth here. There's maybe North America, South America, Africa is somewhere in there, right? And Europe. And of course, earth is famously what we call a closed system, meaning for the most part, we have energy inputs from the sun, but the mass stays the same. Of course, the math doesn't literally stay the same. We have things like asteroids can bring in new rocks. Um, humans send stuff up into space. But by and large, considering the huge mass of the Earth, it's mostly just energy inputs. We'll call that E. And for the most part, mass is constant. M is constant. So by contrast, then an open system would be one where mass does change, where there are inflows and outflows of mass that are considerable. So... An open system would be many subsets of the Earth. Let's take, for example, uh, a lake. You know, kind of a little, this is a profile of a lake, maybe. Got some water in there. Maybe some people having some fun on the shore. Maybe there's a forest on the other side with some trees. So a lake, you think about it, okay, you can have inputs and outflows of mass. Of course, the obvious inflow would be something like rain. Uh, introduces new water. You can introduce other forms of mass too. Let's say humans start putting boats in it. You know, you start doing enough boating and then people leave, they take their boats with them. Inflows and outflows of mass. Who knows what the fish are doing, uh, the plants that live in here. The point is it's a very dynamic system. And when we talk about water with open systems, another important distinction to make is steady versus unsteady state. 
So steady versus unsteady state systems, and these come up a lot in engineering applications, but in earth science as well. Steady state means that nothing changes with time. Nothing changes with time. So for the more mathematically inclined of us, of course, this means that d beta dt, lowercase t, apologize for the use of a Greek letter, but just bear with me, uh, is zero. So this is whatever property we, we're looking at. Something is not changing with time. So if we're thinking about mass, for example, mass of water, let's say with the, the example of this lake, d m water dt equals zero. So of course, the change of mass with respect to the change in time is zero. That would be something that is at steady state. So of course, if we assume that's true, and you can do that by analyzing the lake, right? Let's say people are analyzing the water level within the lake, which is something that scientists obviously do. Then you could determine, okay, the water level doesn't fluctuate very much then we could say, okay, it's at steady state, or maybe during certain seasons, it's largely at steady state. Then what can we say? Well, these water cycle processes are happening in equilibrium at equal rates, right? So let's think about what the water cycle would imply for this lake. We would have evaporation, bringing water out of here. We would have, so we'll call this M dot evaporation. The dot over the M usually indicates that it's a flow of mass with respect to time. We could have water coming in in the form of precipitation. So this could be M dot precip. And then of course, interactions with groundwater, right? This is something we don't consider in most introductory lessons on water cycle interactions. But all of these layers of rock aren't perfect insulators. There's going to be water flow through here. Of course, I've got videos on permeability and porosity. So water leaves through here as well. So we'll have a M dot. We would call this a groundwater infiltration. It infiltrates into the ground. So we have different things interacting. Of course, water might flow into the lake from the ground as well. Maybe if there's a steep gradient up here and water soaks in here and then flows in, you know, we can have as many of these inflows and outflows as we want. And all those are going to be measured by the change in the water level. Conversely, if we have something like a river, then you might look at the level combined with something like that. The rate at which the river is flowing might indicate more water. And these things change with time. The point is steady state, dmw dt equals zero. We might have that with a lake. We might have that with an aquifer. But it's important to measure these things and estimate what these things are because we as humans also interact with these, right? If this lake is to be replaced with a reservoir, all of a sudden we might have pumps, you know? We might have some of this leaving because it's being pumped out. And so understanding the careful balance of these environmental factors is important. If this thing was at equilibrium before, right, which heck, we'll, we'll write out the equation here, right, then the inflows are equal to the outflows in order for this to be true. Then we would say the mass flow rate from precipitation plus the mass flow rate uh, coming in from the ground, we'll call that m dot gw, must be equal to the stuff going out in order for that water level to not change. m dot evaporation plus m dot infiltration. So these are ins and these are outs. Now you can understand things that are at steady state originally, which Nature is, of course, very turbulent, very, very dynamic, but for shorter periods of geologic time, this is often what we see. And so when we come in and start doing things like pumping from aquifers, from reservoirs, all of a sudden we have extra terms coming out, and that disturbs the equilibrium. So understanding what are acceptable disturbances, you know, uh, sustainable, you might say, uh, or what kind of periods, let's say, when we're pumping from wells, you know, do we want to 
accelerate, decelerate our speeds, because all of these things are, of course, related to how much mass is stored within them to begin with. This is why in the American West, we have a bit of a problem with with water usage, you know, uh, the, and then down in Texas, the famous Ogallala Aquifer being sucked dry. Because for a while, and this is a big issue, of course, in Earth sciences, we assume things to be inexhaustible. Inexhaustible. I hope I spelled that right. I think it's an I there. Not certain. But this is, of course, not the case in the case of many resources. You know, for a while with, with such small, and this, this gets into the resource economics of things, right? You know, early humans could assume things to basically be inexhaustible because we were a small species and we could only have so much of an impact. But now as we develop technologies, our population continues to grow, our ability to impact the environment increases so much more. And so thinking about where we can control ourselves and what kind of controls we have on the environment is incredibly important. I think I'll end that here. Hopefully that was good review. You know, the water cycle, again, incredibly basic. Uh, but this is really, really critical to looking at water systems and hydrogeology in general. Of course, you know, a, a hydrogeologist might be thinking or a, or, a, or someone more involved with the groundwater engineering is going to be thinking about these things more frequently, right? The, uh, the mathematics and modeling how rates of change are occurring or, or how much of X or Y we can change without impacting too much uh, property Z that we consider to be de de desirable. You know, these are all the mathematical considerations, but for all of us in terms of what we want uh, as people, which should be a, an, an environment of acceptable quality, right? Uh, I think that's what most of Earth science gets back to, really. Maybe barring some, some theoretical, let's say historical geology, perhaps. Most of what we're concerned with is, is the preservation, is being good stewards to the planet. Um, and there's a lot of nuance to these things. And so being able to think about everything in terms of we have impacts. There are certain things that occur at steady state, not at steady state. And how do we quantify our impacts is incredibly important. So I'll end it there. Thank you for watching.